but let's start. So welcome uh, to this week's machine learning coffee seminar. Uh, today we have a very exciting talk uh, from Thomas. So it's going to be about, about navigation and motion patterns. And, and Thomas is a recent uh, assistant professor in, in Aalto in, in the department of ELEC. So Thomas, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, first of all, a bit brief about the talk. So considering that this is uh, mostly oriented for uh, machine learning community uh, talks, I figured out that it would be good to maybe not dive immediately into technical details of the problems that I'm working with, but sort of to first explain the problem that I'm coping with or I'm trying to cope with and then uh, and then actually uh, to give a brief overview uh, of the solutions that I'm proposing and how they are impacting the field of robotics. So it will be more high level than what you can be used to uh, in this seminar, but I also, that, also hope that you will enjoy this talk anyway. So this, that said, uh, I will be talking today about anticipation motion patterns for improved navigation. And before we, I will jump into the problem of anticipating motion patterns, and I will go into details what I mean by that word or by that phrase, uh, let's set up the stage. So where is my problem being set up? So let's think about a robot in the airport or in any other populated environment. Uh, the robot is navigating through that environment. The robot has some kind of range sensor, but as you can see, the range sensor is, has limited field of view. And this is very realistic. Even with the modern sensors, you will have some kind of cutoff distance. It can be 50 meters, it can be 100 meters, it can be 150 meters, but there will be no complete coverage of the environment. Second of all, there will be also obstacles that will introduce occlusions in the environment. That said, that means we cannot see behind the corners, we cannot see what is in the different part of the building. And this is sort of the source of information that we are coping with uh, in the problems that I'm addressing in robotic navigation. So limited field of view. Second thing is obstacles. And obstacles are problematic, uh, but they are also easy to cope with because obstacles are preventing the robot from operating freely, but they are also, most of the obstacles are static. So if they are once there, they will remain there. We can map them, we can use one of the many existing algorithms to, to put them in the robot's map and we are able to plan around them. However, there are those pesky people moving around which we cannot really map. We can track them, we can, in robotic community, we can clearly see where they are heading, where they are going. There are very good algorithms doing predictions and uh, they are enable robots to actually avoid and interact with people in a predictable way. But once again, we can do only this with people that we can see. And there are also plants. And plants, I'm, I'm highlighting them here because plants are not static obstacles. They are not dynamic obstacles. They are semi-static. That means that they can move around. They can be moved around by staff. They can be moved by people. They can appear and disappear, and they will also substantially affect behavior of the robot. In plants, you can put whatever you want. You can put um, luggage, you can put freight boxes, you can put uh, temporary road cones, you can put any kind of object that can be easily moved and transported, although it remains unmoved for extended periods of time. So, this is our stage. This is where our robot is coping with the problems that it's going to uh, that is going to face. So, what problem are we really coping with? We are coping, or I'm coping with a fairly simple problem: how to make the robot to go from its current location, which is here, to the goal. As simple as that. And of course, I want to do it sa safely and efficiently because we don't want to crash into people and we want to do it quickly. So if we start to think about the problem, it means that it's not really as simple as this drawing because there is also 
there is also many things happening, as I pointed out in the first part of the presentation. So we have environment with obstacles, including static and semi-static obstacles. We have people that we can see, which is actually good because then we can actually predict where those people will go. And here I made those uh, ellipsoids, which should mimic uh, Gaussian distributions, which are, which are showing how the usually prediction works. So we are unfolding the trajectory and we are, in, we, are also, we are also estimating the uncertainty regarding the prediction. So we can say that, okay, I see this person right now here and I expect considering its motion model and considering current observed velocity, this person will be going further in this direction, however, increasing with increasing uncertainty. But this is the easy part of the problem. And I'm saying word easy, knowing that it's not really trivial, but this is something that has been investigated substantially for past, I think, few decades now. There are, in two years ago, Andrei Rudenko from Bosch uh, and Orebrew University has published a very good survey paper on the problem how to, uh, a very good survey paper on the problem of people motion prediction. The real problem is like, what is happening here? So, is this path between the start and the goal, which is avoiding the static obstacle, which is avoiding the predicted path, really the best possible path to follow? And one can say, yeah, there will be some people around here. We will be avoiding them, and that's fine. However, in reality, it's not really that fine. Why? Because whoever is... Whoever is interacting with traffic, I wanted to say whoever is driving a car, but it's probably not true nowadays. Whoever is interacting with any kind of traffic, either as a pedestrian or a car driver or a cyclist or user of any kind of uh, personal transport, transportation device, will know that they, there are written or unwritten rules that we have to adhere to. And there are also traffic rules. And considering that, of course, one can say that in this whole space, which is outside of the sensor range, we can say like, yeah, we can just encode, we can just take the, 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 uh, the traffic law and put it inside of the robot and everything will be fine. However, whoever has been at the airport maybe we, should, we still all remember that days, remembers that there are no rules at the airport. Although you will know if you ever had opportunity, and I really, ad, I really advertise this, like talk with people who are designing large communal spaces. It's really fascinating to talk, about, to talk with them about their work. They know that actually crowds, people tend to follow patterns. And they are less interested in how they are following the patterns. They are more interested in how to force people to behave in the way that the designer want. Once again, we can try to encode that. But here the problem is a bit more complex. There are no books. There are no rules. There are no firm publications on like how to make people to follow in this way or another. Uh, so what is left? The only thing that is left, we can actually teach the robot or make the robot learn that there are some implicit traffic rules happening in the environment. And this is the place where my research topic is really kicking in. So what I'm trying to do in my research is I'm trying to find ways to model uh, how people tend to move in the environment outside of the robot's field of view. So in principle, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to learn spatial motion models in the environment. I, in the rest of the talk, I will be talking about dynamics. I will be talking about patterns of dynamics. And this is, from my point of view, a very convenient shorthand, but 
for for just consistency i would like to emphasize that whenever i'm talking about dynamics i'm talking about the change in the environment about motion in the environments i'm not talking about dynamics in this classical sense that we are usually thinking when we are thinking about like mechanics so i'm not having any differential equations there happening i'm thinking about like uh, or forces i'm really thinking about how people or actually any other objects move in the environment so that said i also have to and uh, my second part of my research is like how i can utilize this information so instead of like having this path here that has to avoid all those people going towards the robot how the robots can actually jump into the flow of the people can merge into the the the, the pattern of, of dynamics that is present in the environment and how can it follow this flow with much slower much much smaller control effort and also being much more acceptable uh, by the people in the environment and finally i have also a small curiosity in the end that actually knowledge about uh, motion patterns in the environment can speed up the problem speed up solution uh, speed up speed up solving the problem of uh, speed up solution for motion planning problem which i think is really fascinating and really interesting although not yet fully explored so the key thing uh, so of course i'm i'm i started my research on the problem in 2000 12, 13, and it would be a blunt lie or just a bit of being crude to say that I'm the one who figured it out that we need this kind of research uh, in our lives. Actually, the problem across different fields has been investigated for a long, long time. Uh, it has been called many different names, uh, and in one of the of my goals is to actually to try to put all those methods under one common umbrella called maps of dynamics and what are maps uh, so in before we will start to use this term maps of dynamics properly let's first talk a bit what dynamics is exactly in this more uh in this more robotic sense or it is in my sense more so in principle I recognize two types of dynamics. So there, are, there is either motion of discrete objects or flow of continuous media. Uh, we will start with flow of continuous media. Some of, if we, if we still remember from, I know from high school, maybe some, some of you are still working with the problems related to computational fluid dynamics. There are two types of flow of continuous media. There, it can be laminar flow or turbulent flow. Laminar flow is when the lines, uh, in the flow are not intersecting turbulent flow is when uh, the lines of the flow are actually intersecting with each other here we have an example of uh, of uh, how do you call it of of uh, smoke coming from uh, extinguished candle we can see that here we still have a nice laminar flow and here we have this more uh, and i'm using it in now in uh, this term in a very colloquial way a bit of chaotic uh, jumble of of different types of moving particles going in all all over the place so this is how the flow how continuous media move but we also have discrete objects and this is something that i'm very much interested in and i i in my work i recognize three types of motion of discrete objects i have static objects and this is a bit tricky thing to, to think about this as a dynamics but I tend to say that if something is not moving, this is also a type of dynamics, just with zero velocity all the time. Then we have semi-static objects. Semi-static objects are objects that are moving during the robot's mission, but the motion, but they are, but the robot is not really observing it moving all the time. It can this motion can happen even when the robot is not observing given object. And finally, we have dynamic objects. So the objects that actually the robot can perceive as moving and here we have a few examples once again airport as you can see my favorite topic uh 
some examples of static obstacles in the environment. So we have those columns in the environment or any other structural elements. We have those information kiosks that are there, that are anchored, that are connected with the teleinformatic infrastructure. Then we have semi-static objects. So for example, we have those, uh, those safety lines that are uh, arranging the queue and they are being reconfigured, reconfigured multiple times a day. We have those bins with, uh, with shopping goods that are being put there or removed there uh, or removed like a few times a day or at least twice in the morning and in the afternoon. And finally, we have dynamic objects. So everything that is moving in the environment. So uh, depending on the dynamics, dynamics can be represented in different ways. So in principle, there are three groups of maps of dynamics. There are velocity maps, there are trajectory maps, and there are spatial configuration spatial configuration changes maps. Depending on the type of dynamics, different types of representation can be used. And as we can see in this diagram, not all the representations are applicable for all the types of dynamics. But we will go through them to which are applicable for which parts. So first class is spatial configuration changes, uh, maps of spatial configuration changes. And this is the oldest type of representation. They undergo substantial evolution over time. I think that the first idea of using the spatial, uh, the spatial configuration changes maps were are sort of already in the 1985. So basically when the first occupancy grid map pops up, like in the second publication on the topic, the authors are saying that the, the, the occupancy grid map should be able to handle dynamics. Uh, just as is, so they figure it out, okay, let's just ignore dynamics and not care about this. Unfortunately, it's not always working. Usually when we are ignoring dynamics, when we are not handling it in any way, what we are, what is happening, we have some kind of uh, residual information stored in the map, we have offset in the maps, and uh, in general, a lot of uh, uncertainty in the map. So after that, people figure it out, let's remove dynamics. So there was this period of time where the key focus, and I would say that this is still very active, uh, maybe not very active line of research, but very prevalent approach is that let's track moving objects and let's remove them from the map. And in principle, this gives us very good navigational maps. So we know where the walls, where are all those static things in the environment. So we can clearly localize the robot and everything is good and everything is fine and we can localize it. But that means that we are losing all this information that I'm interested in. We don't know where the robots are moving or where the people are moving and how we can actually adhere to the motion patterns. So then there was this era where people figured it out like, okay, we cannot just remove dynamics. Maybe we should update the map according to the dynamics that we can see in the environment. And here we can see another approach where basically the map is being modified based on the some kind of predefined interval, time interval. Uh, and these approaches are nice step forward because now we are, now the researchers recognize, okay, we need to update the environment. The environment is changing. So let's update map every now and then, which is a good tool to model the semi-static objects or the objects that are appearing and disappearing, but it's very, it's not very good for modeling dynamic objects. And finally in, in, in 2013, 2012, uh, there was this idea that actually we can build maps of dynamics. So in this case, we can see an example where basically uh, the colors are corresponding to the level of dynamics. So the green uh, patches are saying that there is low dynamics, so there are not many changes happening, while the red color is telling us that there is something moving around there very often. So we have already this initial grasp of information about dynamics in the map. The blue color is corresponding to static obstacles. However, as I pointed out, this is not the only way of representing dynamics. There's also trajectory mapping and trajectory mapping is especially developed within the computer vision community. It is very uh, rich field. Uh, and the general idea is that if the camera is observing a scene, uh, it is possible to recognize some points of interest. So basically the places where moving pixels, let's start like this, are entering the, the, the scene, uh, 
uh, and when they are exiting the scene, or maybe we can recognize more uh, points of interest. Sometimes it's intersections, sometimes it's some kind of stop points. And we have the activity paths. So basically paths that are being followed by those moving pixels within the scene. Uh, usually those, those representations are tackling the problem with, uh, are, do, are addressing this problem through uh, trajectory clustering, which is very interesting uh, approach. Although, as I will explain later, it's not always a suitable problem for robotics. And finally, last not but least, uh, it's velocity mapping. So in velocity mapping, this is something that is coming from computational fluid dynamics or, uh, or basically is built on top of the vector field. So in this idea is that we are building a spatial model where to each point in the environment, we are associating uh, a, mo a vector describing the motion to that point in the environment. Um, and this is three key uh, groups of representations. My research is mostly falling into the third group. Although I'm not working with, the, uh, with, uh, with vector fields, I'm trying to do something else. Uh, namely, I'm trying to work on the problem called probabilistic flow maps. And how does it work? So in, the, uh, in my research, I developed basically two approaches to the problem. First is occupancy shift. So if we have an intersection and we have paths followed by vehicles through this intersection, what will basically happen, we'll have some kind of uh, route or path followed from one side to another and here like this. And what we can do, we can basically, and, and, when, and what will happen, so if we have a moving object in the environments, then also occupancy in the map. So basically the cells that are saying that something is there will also move across the environment. And usually the first idea will be like, okay, so let's just associate the vector, how the occupancy is exiting uh, each field. But then the problem is that Actually, if we have some occupancy here, then because of the model that is used here, so this, this exit model, it is impossible to clearly predict if the vehicle will go in this direction or it will, it will go in this direction. So what is necessary at this moment in time, we need to have some kind of prediction uh, tool on top of that, that will just remember the history that, okay, uh, because the vehicle was have have been going from this direction, then it's most likely I can go in this direction. What I suggest is that instead of having like a separate module, let's encode it in the map itself. So I have suggested to put a conditional transition map. So basically based on the previous observations, we can store the information where the object will be moving in the future, already in the spatial model. So we, here we can see examples. So if the ob object is moving from this direction, then the object will most likely continue further and likewise here. And how does it work in the more realistic scenario? So on the left, we have like a, a sort of, uh, on the right, we have uh, a, a zoomed in version of, of a map for a roundabout. So we can see that basically now we know here that considering from which direction the, uh, occupancy is shifting, we have two possible exit directions. And from this information, we can actually quite neatly reconstruct the possible motion patterns in the environment. <clears throat> so what is the uh, key message of this part of the talk is that the motion of discrete object corresponds to occupancy changes of the map, representing the current state of the environment. We can, we, the key idea of conditional transition map is to remove the idea that the cell changes are independent and they actually depend on the changes in the neighborhood. And finally, that the flow of occupancy across the environment can be modeled as conditional probability. Uh, the second approach that I have developed is Gaussian mixture field. So basically, as I said, like in computer vision, it's very prevalent that we are doing the, the trajectory clustering, which is a very nice tool. However, in reality, what will happen is that we will not have one smooth trajectory con connecting to points of interest, but we'll have these patches, which are called tracklets, which are saying that, okay, I have seen object one going here. And then for some reason there was misclassification and now I see object 27 going here. And then I have something else, maybe object 17 following, although that in reality is the same object. So what I suggest, let's 
just drop the idea of objects and just let focus on the velocity vectors, which are instantaneous, much easier to recognize and much easier to track. And let's around each point in the environment build a neighborhood for, we, for which we'll be building Gaussian mixture model uh, describing the velocity distribution in the environment. So then from this kind of mess of vectors, of velocity vectors, we'll have somewhat neater representation showing the velocity patterns with uncertainty and with uh, variability in the environment. So how it is done, it is basically I, I'm working with directional data. So I have an ori orientation represented in radians and to each point in the environment, I'm associating Gaussian mixture model, which is basically wrapped on the uh, unit circle. So the elevation above the zero level is corresponding to the speed. The orientation is corresponding to the orientation and the height of this bump is uh, corresponding to the probability uh, of the velocity in given direction. So this is continuous representation. So what is key idea of this method is that I'm taking concepts which are well known in the field of computational fluid dynamics or how we are, how, uh, how continuous media are being uh, modeled into the world of macroscopic discrete objects. Uh, although there is one key limitation uh, or, or there, there is one key problem that is still need to be tackled, namely that we don't have complete observability. That means that it is necessary that when the robot is exploring the environment, it can at one time observe only some points in the environment. That means that in the end of the day, we'll have very sparse map, uh, sparse map of the locations telling us where or how the uh, or, or how the dynamics behaves in this environment. That is why it is necessary late, later on to densify this map. So basically based on the observations from uh, other locations, we need to estimate what is the flow in this environment. And this is something that I'm currently working with. So namely how, uh, uh, how to estimate the correlation between the, the spatial correlation between the flow models in different parts of the environment and how the shape of the environment affect uh, this correlation and how the flow map can be reconstructed considering the observations from in one location to and considering the shape of the environment. Uh, yes, I'm already jumped. Uh, I already explained that. So basically flow maps are representing the direction of the flow in each location in the environment. Uh, and finally, currently what I'm was what I'm investigating is, is how to use the methods of imputation uh, in order to estimate the uh, to estimate the, the missing parts in the environment. Uh, and now I think that I'm running close to my 30 minute mark. I will try to condense my talk uh, and not to expand it too much. So there will be still some time for questions and discussions. So uh, how it can, how it can be used for improving motion planning. And I'm especially talking here about the flow maps. So basically what we want to avoid is we want to avoid such situation that the robot is going from start to goal and is constantly veering off and it's constantly stopping and it's avoiding people and then it's avoiding obstacles. We want to have something like this, that the robot is basically jumping into the flow and it's actually following the flow of the people. And this is where uh, flow aware motion planners are helping us to solve this problem. So how this works. So our initial idea that I have developed with Luigi Palmieri in 2017 is basically to have the uh, global map of the environment, uh, to have the flow map of the environment, then to run fairly simple, fairly simple A star with some small modification of the of the heuristic where beside the, where the cost is being computed, not only as a distance, but also as the adherence to the flow. Uh, and then through biasing uh, an RT, or in this case, in this publication, we have used theta star algorithm in, in case of, in order to build the exact execution of the path, we have biased the theta star 
sampling function uh, with the flow information. And in this way, the robot was able to, first of all, find spaces where there is no flow. And the second of all, and I will show it more in the, uh, in the next slide, uh, follow preferred motion patterns in the environment. And here we can see three examples of how robots converge to the flow and follow the flow, even though that may be the shortest path, shortest Euclidean path will look different, but they are behaving in more human aware, human conscious way. What was the very interesting finding is actually that using the flow information, it was possible to substantially shorten the time necessary for finding the path with, with sampling algorithm, which is very interesting, although it's not surprising because whoever is working with motion planning or looked into motion planning publications recently knows that this is a prevalent trend that in order to speed up the process of motion planning, the information about the previous solutions in the given environment are being stored and reused, excuse me, uh, to recompute uh, the trajectory. And in this way, uh, the path is being found quicker. Uh, so in this case, what we are basically doing, we are not storing our own solutions, but we are storing and reusing the solutions provided us by people who are people who already interacted with the environment. And this set, that was my slice, my, my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I managed to introduce a bit the problem and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thanks a lot for a really interesting talk, Thomas. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can write them in the chat or raise your hand. Or... Uh, so, and while we are waiting, um, one thing that interests me is sort of the, 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 the decomposition of, 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 of the motion into, into dynamics and control. So it, it seems that in, in your talk, you cannot have the control sort of implicitly in, in the system. So it's, can you comment on this? Could you also have like separate control and separate dynamics or would it make sense? Uh, up, to some, up to some degree, I would say yes, but this is something that actually I'm striving to have it more integrated. Uh, because if we think about the robot and I will go to, to like this airport slide, um, where is it? Sorry. So we have this airport slide here. So this robot where we have been working with this robot is 1.7 meter high and it weighs 250 kilos. You, if you, 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 you want it to be safe and also to behave in, uh, in a predictable way. So you can make the, it behave in a predictable way only if you integrate the information about the dynamics into the, the control information. So that's why I'm saying that you can do that. Nobody will forbid you to, to, to sort of to have it as a separate, uh, as a separate modules that, uh, that, are, uh, that are existing in your robotic system. But in the end of the day, you would like to have it as close as possible and maybe even provide the information about the spatial dynamics or the dynamics in the environment directly into the control loop. So I would say, yes, you can do that, but probably this is not something that you would like to achieve in the end of the day. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so Laura seems to have a question. Oh yes, yeah. so thank you Thomas, that was super interesting. So I, I was just wondering, so, so now that you are tracking the, the flow patterns of the objects in the environment, so how do you initialize the system every time that there will be new objects entering? So do you use something like optical flow then to look at the whole image or, or are you doing still some kind of like object detection to kind of like get the new comers into the picture? Okay, that's, that's a great question because, uh, <laughs> because there are multiple things that can be done and on multiple levels. So I so 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 the, the level that you are referring to is directly perception level, not at the model level. And actually now I'm trying in, in, in my models, I'm trying to be a bit agnostic about this. So uh, uh, so I'm 
still using uh i'm still using uh how to say it i'm still using object tracking algorithms relying on lighters although this is something that i want to drop as soon as possible because as i as i have explained there are a lot of issues that can occur uh using them uh, and this is something that it and and i don't want to sound uh I don't want to say anything bad about object tracking or people tracking algorithms. There is a lot of great work out there, which is which their algorithms are really robust and there's really it's really great to work with them. But I would like to minimize my dependence in my models on those algorithms because always something can go astray. So that said, uh, I'm now investigating the ways of reliably estimating the velocity of objects without tracking them. So basically some kind of two-dimensional or three-dimensional object flow, uh, optical flow. Uh, and also what would be interesting, I have also started to, I, I was working a bit with the concept of radars, which give you uh, through, the, through the Doppler effect are giving you immediately the information about the, the velocity of the object. Of the object, so immediately you can have this information in the uh, in the scan itself. But this is one level. The second level, which is about the initialization, it's namely how to initialize the model itself, because we can always say like, okay, it's possible that all the velocities in all directions are equally possible. So we have like this uniform field, which everything is possible everywhere. But I think that every one of us can like looking at the map of the environment can say like. Yeah, but people will very unlikely go towards walls. They will walk along the walls. They will walk across uh, uh, across the, the plazas. They will be attracted by, by some point. So cu currently, with uh, in collaboration with uh, with uh, with Villa Kirki's group, uh, we are looking into problem how to actually use uh, deep learning in this context in order to initialize the model based on the shape of the environment. So how the shape of the environments actually affect the, uh, affect the potential flow in the environment. And then using uh, some kind of online update method to actually update the model afterwards. So as I said, there are two levels to your question about the initialization. So one is like how we are initializing on this perception level and how we are initializing the the model, they are both still open research questions like how to do it properly. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any, any other questions? We, we, have, we have plenty of time. Okay, so it seems that everything was crystal clear, so that's, that's very good. So in, in that case, I, I would like to thank the speaker again for a really, really great talk and also thank the audience for your attention. So yeah, that's it for today. So have a nice day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Really thanks, Thomas. So we will definitely have to arrange a meeting soon and, and, and discuss I'm, I'm this looking more. Forward. I'm no. looking forward. Me too. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Also, I actually have also worked a bit on we do stuff with ODs.